And now I have the honor of preaching Christ's resurrection to you. So grace and peace to you from God, our creator, Jesus, the risen Christ, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. Amen. As the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary woke up early and went to see the tomb. In Matthew's gospel, the women go to see. They're not carrying spices to anoint the body like in the other gospels. In this version of the story, the two Marys, they go empty-handed to see the tomb. The Greek word used here for to see can also mean to watch or to discern or to hold vigil. So we get a sense from Matthew that these women, they knew what they were doing. Coming to see the tomb empty-handed to watch. They didn't bring spices to anoint the body, not because they were unprepared, but because they were filled with hope and expectation. This first Easter, the women had to have some sense of hope to go to the tomb in the first place to watch. You don't just go to watch a stone. They must have expected that something would have happened. They must have believed Jesus, who earlier in the gospel told them that on the third day he will rise again. The women went and watched with anticipation, holding vigil in hope discerning for themselves that Jesus was no liar and they had to bear witness to the truth. The women expected the words of Jesus to be true. They were hopeful that death did not have the last word. And yet, we are told, they were afraid. Even in the midst of their hope that Easter morning, their fear remained. Hopeful and afraid, the women went to see the tomb. They had seen the power of death. They had seen their own friends turn against Jesus, deny him, even cry out, crucify him. They had seen an empire that would stop at nothing to destroy their hope, all in the name of power and false hope. They had witnessed state-sanctioned torture on a cross. They had seen death. And they were afraid. The women were not as afraid as the other disciples who were locked away in their homes out of fear in this time, but they were still timid as they approached the tomb with a small glimmer of hope, trying to discern what would be unveiled to them, trying to process what they might see. And sure enough, they were met with something of a show to watch, to pay attention to. They were met with an earthquake and an angel who appeared like lightning and rolled back the stone and then sat on it. The guards were so afraid that the story says they became like dead men. Maybe they passed out. And to the women, still standing, watching, waiting, holding vigil, the angel says, do not be afraid. The angel commands them to go and tell others, he is not here, he has been raised. And the angel sends them with the promise that Jesus will meet them there, they will see Jesus. But we know that their fear doesn't magically go away. The tomb is empty, Jesus is not there, he is risen. They are overjoyed and they are still afraid. They have been stripped of their Messiah and of their son. They still have the trauma of witnessing such a violent death of someone they love. They still live in oppressive empire. They still have given everything to fund this movement. They still have friends and loved ones who turned against them. They still don't know what happens next. And yet the mystery remains. The tomb is empty. Christ is not there he is risen somehow. The story says that they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to meet the disciples to share the good news. They were sprinting away from an empty tomb and a perched angel to share what they had seen. They were both afraid and filled with great joy, running along, knowing only half of the story, knowing only that the tomb was empty. Imagine the racing thoughts in their mind as they run, overcome by what they had witnessed, confused by what they had not yet seen, grateful they had followed their gut and gone to keep watch, but still afraid of the unknown, yet joyful and filled with hope. The tension in this moment is a tension we may have never known so intimately if it was not for the current pandemic that we are engulfed in. This moment of knowing half the story I understand this Easter like never before what it means to feel both fear and great joy together. Some are filled with more fear than joy in this time. 
fear of isolation, fear of being infected, fear of change, fear of loss of income, fear of loss of routine, fear of death. And some are filled with more joy than fear in this time. Joy at having more quality time with family, joy at being able to get housework done, joy at having a slower pace of life. And one thing I've noticed is how quickly we are to suggest a right reaction to pandemic and by default a wrong way to endure it. I've heard comments like, if you are joyful right now, then you don't care about those suffering. If you're joyful, you are privileged and insensitive. If you are joyful, you are putting others at risk. And on the flip side, I've heard, if you are afraid, you aren't prepared enough. If you are afraid, you are too sensational. If you are afraid, you do not have enough faith. I've noticed so much judgment about how we either need to feel this way or that way or we're wrong. But I've got good news for you. Not good news. I've got news for you right first. There's no right way to, under, to undergo the trauma of a pandemic. There's no right way to do it. Be easy on yourselves. This Easter, I am both afraid to be in this room with other people at the risk of exposing others and myself, and I'm blessed and grateful to be here preaching hope. I am overjoyed to share in this Easter with you and disappointed that we cannot share in it physically in one another's presence with more than 10 people. I'm afraid for vulnerable populations, and I'm filled with joy at the ways people are showing God's love to one another in this time. I'm afraid of not knowing what will come, and I'm overcome with joy at the promises that Easter brings to us in this time and place. Our gospel lesson teaches us that this Easter, as we approach the tomb to see, to wait, to watch, as we look with anticipation, as we come empty-handed with only our hope, we can hold things in tension. We can run away from the empty tomb with both fear and great joy, not knowing at all, not having all the right answers or doing things the right way, but waiting and bracing for the mystery, holding vigil for the new life popping up all around us, trusting that out of death there is always resurrection. It's okay to be both afraid and joyful this Easter. It's okay to feel moments of joy in this time when others are suffering. It's okay to be so much more afraid than those around you. It's okay to have hope. It's okay to run proclaiming the good news, not knowing what will happen next. The angel assures us, as he assured the women, do not be afraid, Jesus will meet you there. And sure enough, suddenly Jesus met them as the story goes. And in meeting them, the risen Christ gently and calmly and without judgment says, greetings. This Easter, we do not have to choose between fear and joy. We are told, do not be afraid, 365 times in Scripture, once for every day of the year. And still, Jesus meets us in our fear more times than that. Jesus stops us in our frantic tracks as we run away, not knowing, engulfed with fear and joy, and says, greetings. This Easter, I cannot in good conscience tell you there's nothing to be afraid of. We have plenty to fear, and much is uncertain. But I can promise you that although there is much to fear, we don't have to be afraid, because Jesus lives. Fear does not have to overcome our hope. Death does not have to have the last word. Jesus both overcame death so that we have nothing to fear, and the risen Christ meets us in our joy and our fear this Easter. Just as he met the women in both their fear and great joy the first Easter and stops them in their tracks. Maybe this is the most real Easter of our lifetimes because we know more about holding things in tension. We know more about being away from our worship spaces, grief stricken in our homes like the disciples. We know more of what it feels like to have our world change like a flash of lightning and to feel the earthquake around us shifting our normal. We know more about how the empire fails us. We know more about fear and the power of death. But we also know more about gratitude and joy for the little things that are not so little after all. We know more about needing Jesus to meet us. We know more about holding vigil and waiting with anticipation for new life. We know more about how resurrection changes everything. It's been a long season of Lent, wandering in the wilderness of pandemic. But Easter is here, 
And Jesus gives us the gift of new life no matter where we are. No matter how we are handling things right now, Jesus died and rose again for us. The risen Christ meets us on whatever end of the spectrum of fear and joy we're on right now. Siblings in Christ, Easter is not the end. We don't have to magically feel better today, but we do have reason to have hope. Easter is just the beginning. We are Easter people running wild like the two Marys to proclaim the good news, not knowing for sure what will happen next, but freed by the mystery, empowered by the empty tomb we watched and longed for, freed by the risen Christ, empowered by new life out of death, believing the words of Jesus, clinging to them, running free to meet God with fear and great joy, trying our best not to be afraid, and knowing that the risen Christ meets us regardless. We are just getting started, running in good faith, trusting that the risen Christ meets us. Siblings in Christ, Christ is risen and we do not have to be afraid. Christ is risen and death does not have the last word. Christ is risen and you are beloved. Christ is risen and meets you exactly where you are this Easter. Say it with me. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.